Hi, and welcome to The Caption Live, a show for the most casual and dedicated fans of comics and a member of the Comic Watch family. I'm your host, Sean. Join me and discover what the world of comics and graphic novels have to offer. From one-on-one interviews with industry professionals, roundtable discussions with passionate fans, and reviews on the latest comics, TV shows, and movies. Now let's dive right on in. Hey everyone, and thank you for joining us. If this is your first time, thanks for checking us out. And if you're a returning listener, thanks for coming back. As many of you know, the Caption Life has recently become part of the Comic Watch family, but I realize that some of you may not be familiar with Comic Watch or know what it is exactly. So what better way to explain it than to invite the editor-in-chief on the show to talk about it. So please welcome Matt Meyer. Matt has been reading, collecting, and loving comics for over 30 years. He's humbled and honored to be part of Comic Watch since 2018 and editor-in-chief since 2021. By day, he's a social worker helping the less fortunate finding housing and going from surviving to thriving giving hope might just be his superpower he's also a husband and father to three wonderful kids he's lived in oklahoma city his whole life and wouldn't trade it for anything welcome to the show matt how are you doing uh i'm good thank you for having me sean i have to say i'm um thrilled humbled excited uh this is my first time ever being asked to join one of these so i'm, I'm like oh my gosh am i Am I somebody now? Um, <laughs> well, I'm honored I, to have you on the show. Has, yeah. it, has it happened? Um, <laughs> no, seriously, I, I definitely appreciate the invite, man. Yeah. Well, and I realized that I probably, when we talked about having the caption life be part of Comic Watch, I sh- probably should have had you on earlier um, to kind of, you know, do that whole introduction and kind of do that announcement together and everything like that. Ooh. So I apologize that I didn't get you on there earlier. I just, you know, as you know, I was kind of trying to get everything figured out and all that, but this, I'm glad yeah, that's, that that's we got you in of here. My life. <laughs> There you go. So, well, um, let's go ahead and dive in and let's start with the first question that I always like to ask people. And that is, what is your comic book origin story? Was there like a particular comic or person or event that got you into that uh, whole fandom that we both enjoy? No, Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, no, that's the short answer. Um, Okay. <laughs> the long answer is, I mean, like a lot of kids in, in the 80s, um, <clears throat> I liked G.I. Joe. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, Walden Books had this old school spinner rack. Uh, those of you that are old enough to remember a Walden Books, good on you. Um, your back hurts today. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, then you'd, you'd see a G.I. Joe comic. And, oh, man, G.I. Joe. I like G.I. Joe toys. Dad, can I have this? And, you know, 75 cents later, um, G.I. Joe number 80 is uh, still to this day one of my favorite one and done comic stories. Um, you know, and I don't want to go too far out on a separate branch here, but um, just in terms of like all of the various uh, balls that Larry Hama famously had to juggle with that comic, you know, he had to not only tell a coherent story, but he had to basically act as an advertisement for this toy line. This whole issue is basically about introducing new vehicles and characters and he manages to make this whole 22 page story out of it that makes sense and works within the context of of everything else that's going on it's just this really cool thing Mm -hmm. so um comics are just always kind of there in the periphery and then uh here we go a few years later it's it's 1991 and I see this this shiny new X Men number one comic with Jim Lee's Magneto doing like this on the cover, and um, I was like, man, I I hear that these X Men are really neat, and so I begged my mom to buy it for me, and and that was it. It was done. We're on. We're off to the races. So um, yeah, I mean, as far and so far as Secret Origins go, there's there's not a lot happening there that probably a lot of other people couldn't mirror, uh, but you know, it's it's one of those things that you know when you're a kid and maybe lots of kids like comics lots of kids like x-men fleer trading cards or what have you right and for them it's a passing fad um and just part of their growing up phase but for me like comics really became part of just who i am as Mm -hmm. as as my as who if you want to know me you need to understand that i love the this art that we call comics and not just the superheroes but 
the whole process itself. Um, uh, when I uh, was a, you know, a little older, high school age, and I first started really getting into vertigo stuff, um, uh, Preacher became my lodestone. It's still my favorite comic to this day. Uh, and, you know, just, just everything, indie, big two, um, it just, you know, it's all good. And, and, and I love it all. And I love promoting the art to people because I don't believe that comics are to this day. I think a lot of people somehow still feel that comics are kid stuff, mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh yeah. Despite the billions of dollars made at the box office by comic book film, mm -hmm. there's still always going to be this subset of people that cannot get their mind around the fact that comics aren't just for kids. They're a legitimate art form. And so when I talk to people about this that are, you know, outside that, outside the comics bubble, I'm always, I always want to make sure to hit on that <clears throat> because, uh, so many people, so much work goes into making a comic. It's not just, you know, a lot of people look at it and, and they say, wait, more than one person does that, you know? <laughs> and so, I, yeah, yeah. Like there's a whole process here. There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen and they have to work together seamlessly to make this thing happen and work. And yeah, it's, it's such a labor of love. Right. And, I, you know, like like you said, when uh, in, in my bio there, I, I've been reading comics regularly for over three decades now. I'm 42 years old. So I'll let y'all do the math on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it, it's it's a it's a lifetime love and it's never going away. Mm -hmm. You know, I, and I think uh, a lot of people our age, you know, have that similar experience that the X-Men animated series really helped introduce a lot of people to comics. Ooh, and, ooh. and for me, actually it was kind of the opposite because I had a, uh, or I had a, a, I have an uncle that has a whole box uh, boxes of comics and just a whole collection from some of the original ones that came out and were published back then. And that's how I got introduced to X-Men. So I actually came across it through some of the original, um, uh, first generation publications of X-Men before the series came oh, cool. out, but the series introduced me to Wolverine and Colossus. So that scene in the background there, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, Nightcrawler, all those things and, and all those characters. And so that uh, series has really been a key moment and, and pivotal experience for yeah. a lot of people our age that like, got them into Absolutely. comics yeah so it's it's definitely okay. been part of our experience and is a milestone for a lot of people in our generation well absolutely and if you want to like you mentioned i'm a social worker um mm -hmm. and I've, I've been doing that for going on five years now um oh wow great my, my pat thank you you know my passion for social justice i think has its origins in x-men yes <laughs> there's a lot of things in that yeah and that was something I've just kind of been idly contemplating. Um, that was, you know, I'm pretty sure Claremont <laughs> had a hand in that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, like they've had a those comics specifically have had an impact on me in a very direct way in terms of my journey and my passions in life. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, let's go ahead and dive into Comic Watch. And let me just throw it out there. I know what it is, but for our listeners, can you explain what exactly is Comic Watch and, um, you know, anything that you want people to know about it, um, you know, kind of what to take away from it and what they should, you know, why they should check Comic Watch out? Most definitely. So uh, Comic Watch uh, started in 2017. It is an all volunteer organization. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, you know, we get a little bit of scratch off of some advertisers, a little bit of, uh, of of that that sort of stuff popping up. But I mean, I don't get paid to do this. It's a labor of love, right? Um, so it, we're all volunteer. It's DIY, very punk ethos. So we're we're predominantly um, a review site. Uh, we've got. We've got editorial pieces that we fire off, not as not, not as frequently as I'd like, but for the most part, um, you know, we're we're very liberal um, mm -hmm. in in terms of just our outlook um, and the co the 
causes that we champion throughout the site and throughout our opinions and our, in our works themselves. Mm -hmm. um, we are always accepting new applicants for uh, to write on the site. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find a link right there on our front page, comic-watch.com, if you're interested. But the big thing is this, and <clears throat> excuse me, about comic watches. We're not in this for clicks. We're not right. in this to go tackle Newsarama and CBR and be their competition and beat them up and be the upstart or anything like that. We're here because we love comics. We love the people that make comics and we want to give back to that community and be, be a part of that conversation. Like, you know, look, I, I have got over three decades of love of comics in my life. Those mm -hmm. it's, it's part of who I am. It's part of my identity and I'm not alone in that. And, you know, once upon a time, I fancied myself to be a comics writer someday, and it never happened for various reasons, but um, that's okay. I get mm -hmm. to give back to the industry in this way. Right. And I mean, along the way, we, you know, some of the perks, uh, you get to talk to cool people. You get to talk to Mark Wade. You get to talk to Steve <laughs> Orlando um, and David Pepos and, and all of these awesome writers and artists uh that otherwise you know i never get a chance to talk with them otherwise and just you know you could skill do what we're doing right now and you build this sort of kinship uh with them even for you know 30 45 minutes an hour and um it it's cool it's just cool mm -hmm. at the end of the day yeah i no and i agree completely in that um, everything you said, one of the things I have been very open about what I love about Comic Watch is that it's not a clickbait type of site. And I think yeah. I've mentioned this before in our uh, team Slack channel and everything is that I've always appreciated how we never strive for that because there's some websites out there that have literally upset me because of that approach they've taken. And I have never seen that done with comic watches. So that's one of the things I really love about this site is that we never do it for the clicks. And just as you said, our team is really um, diverse in terms of everyone's backgrounds yeah. and, and, and everything. And I love that uh, we have that as part of our um, team and, and that's our approach and that we always try uh, to strive for, you know, including different communities and, and all that we do and everything. And so I, that's one of the reasons why I absolutely love comic watch and and that kind of what makes things uh that's kind of in my opinion makes comic watch stand out from the other sites is that it's not clickbait it's um all volunteer so we're not doing it for pay we do it because we love it and we are really uh, a team that focuses in on being inclusive and i love how you shared that you were somebody that had thought about writing a comic one day and it never you know came to happen but this is writing for comic watch is another great way to be involved with and contribute back to the community because i'm the same way like i'm not a writer or an artist so i always felt like there's nothing i could really do to contribute be part of that comic community except for the fact that writing for comic watch and being able to be part of that voice and part of that uh, opportunity and experience really allows me to connect in the comic world in that different way, because I don't have that skill set that it takes to be a, a professional in the comic industry as a writer right. or an artist. And so I think that's well, a great way to kind of think about comic watch in that context. And, 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 and you know, you and I are right around the same age. So when I was mm -hmm. like aggressively trying to, get my foot in the door, Marvel and DC still took open submissions. Like you could just mail them some shit. Right. And I was like, wow, this is cool. I'm just going to do this. Yeah. So, um, so I send off this, this pitch for the Hulk, you know, I'm, I love Peter David Hulk. It's one of my touchstones as a comic reader. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm thinking to myself, it's and it's the year 2000 roughly. Uh, 2001 right in there and I'm thinking mm. man wouldn't it be cool if somebody wrote a story about Bruce Banner having to deal with all these multiple aspects of the Hulk at once now in Immortal Hulk of course more recently that uh, that was done very very well by Al, Al Ewing but at the time that this like we just hadn't seen it 
So, man, this is really cool. So I, I write up this thing and say, hey, this is what I do. I send it off. And uh, about six months later, Paul Jenkins takes over writing Hulk from John Byrne. And lo and mm. behold, his story has to do with the Hulk <laughs> dealing with multiple Hulk personalities all at the same time. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so I anybody you know i don't only think it's paul jenkins he probably uh you know he's a good writer hell of a writer <laughs> best story ever uh but i i and i i can't prove this obviously but <laughs> I, I i've always felt like somebody at marvel read that and was like Ooh, that's a good idea but we're not gonna take a risk on this guy we've never heard of so yeah that was that was my little origin i had i had some creative-minded friends uh, around the same time we were talking about starting an independent comics company of course this was Again, right around the turn of the century. So the internet was there, but it wasn't in the same way that it is now. Right. So it didn't go anywhere. Um, but I mean, and then, you know, from there, life just kind of took over. I had, I was a young father. I had a little, a little boy to, to deal with my, my, my marriage fell apart at a young age. So it was like, mm. I got to work, not write comics. And mm. that's how it went. But um, yeah, dude, I, you know, dreams deferred, but <laughs> all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, I love doing what I'm doing. I um, I love sitting down and just writing, you know, 1,500 or 2,000 words about doomsday clock number 10 and what the hell a metaverse <laughs> is. And now Mark Zuckerberg has taken that from us, but, um, <laughs> you know, or whatever, to mm. use an example. So. Yeah. Well, and, and I think um, you hit on one of the things that I absolutely love with Comic Watch is that opportunity to connect with creators as well, too, on some level. So I remember the very first article I wrote for Comic Watch was a review of Free Guy. And when yes. that got published and got tweeted out, Ryan Reynolds, and it's probably somebody who mans his account. I don't think it's actually him necessarily. But it could be, but... Sure. But the official Ryan Reynolds account uh, for Twitter retweeted that. And I remember just being over the moon thinking like, that is the oh. coolest thing, especially that's my kid's favorite movie is Free Guy. So I got to tell him is that. It? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, he, cool. We watched that movie. I think that's one of the few movies we watched multiple times, um, you know, theater and at home, like within the first three months that's been out and everything. And it's mm -hmm. just uh, he, he just loves it. One well, last year, we actually dressed up as the characters from Free Guy because he wanted to do oh, that. Awesome. So he dressed up as Guy with the blue shirt and the sunglasses and stuff like that. And then he wanted me to be did dude. People get, did people get the reference? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people got the reference. So yeah, so Very they, cool. um, yeah. So it was it was a lot of fun. But I remember that being really neat. And you know, we see uh, comic book publishers will take excerpts of some of our reviews and put them on trade paperbacks or or wherever because i remember i'll go through and pick up an issue or pick up a book and look at the back and there'll be a quote from comic watch i remember Isn't how that cool, cool that is feeling it is Absolutely. a cool feeling oh yeah so yeah. i love that so yeah the first time i remember that happening um uh one of my first review assignments was the killmonger miniseries that mm -hmm. came out on the heels of the first black panther and uh, brian edward hill wrote it and i i shame on me i don't remember the artist but yeah my i had a quote from one of my issues on the back of that trade and it's like ah oh, that's so even cool. though they rarely put the reviewer's actual name i mean it depends on the publisher but um yeah, yeah i mean just getting out there and getting that love from from that side of the of the house and, and being able to have that conversation as fans with the creators and the publishers is is just an irreplaceable feeling oh yeah yeah so since you've been with Comic Watch, what's something you found really surprising or interesting about the comic book industry? Hmm. That, you know, that's a tough, that's a tough question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I honestly, I like, and this might sound slightly disingenuous, but the, e just how easy it is to talk to some of these pros. Mm -hmm. um, in the first few times they do, and, and, and I say that, um, it's not like I'm doing it every day, right? But so, uh, and and obviously, when these pros are doing it, a lot of times, you know, they've got 
a product or a comic that they're wanting to hype. Mm-hmm. And that I, you know, so it's a symbiotic relationship and sort of an unspoken understanding happening there. But the the, the folks, the, the creator's willingness to just sit down and and talk with somebody that uh, they don't know me, you know, <laughs> and then you just vibe with them. Fingers crossed um, is is so cool. Like I never like I, said, I mentioned Mark Wade earlier. Um honor of a lifetime to get to talk to the the guy that 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 wrote kingdom come you know Mm -hmm. um one of my all-time just not just favorite writers but favorite human beings um if i get kurt busiak to talk to me at some point i'll I'll be like right there (laughs) but um i'm i'm never gonna get probably never gonna get another chance to talk to my idols like this and just their willingness to be cool, like I said, and 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 hang out for a little bit. I was, I did burn the bridge a little bit with Mark Wade. Um, oh, really? Well, my fan, I, I I fanboyed out on him a little bit at the end. Um, he told us it was forty five minutes. He had a he had another one of the other podcasts to get to, and we were like right at the edge. And, oh, that's right. Yeah. And 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 I was like, oh my god, you were the flash and you gave us the flash and i just could not stop talking i had verbal diarrhea and um like he was visibly irritated (laughs) and and (laughs) like the second we were done he just out um but i mean for every one of those that that maybe doesn't go the way you want Mm -hmm. or maybe the guest just wasn't comfortable um being interviewed like right it had it happens you know in, in the world of film, Robert De Niro was famously a very bad interview. It does happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes you just don't vibe with people. But sometimes you're totally surprised. Yeah. Uh, Justin Jordan, man, we like we just clicked with that dude. That episode went on for like, or interview, excuse me, went on for like an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. And nobody wanted to leave but it was like okay we've gone for an hour and a half we have to stop <laughs> you know so yeah it's it's really freaking cool like that oh yeah did, did i ever tell you how i met mark wayne recently no i haven't told you this okay i don't think so i'd love to hear it yeah so let me let me share this with you because I, I i posted on social media but i realized i never i probably never sent it to you but um i went to memphis comic con um back in september and he's one of the reasons why i love him is because he wrote a series of daredevil and uh he wrote the issue number seven that has the famous picture of i'm not daredevil with his sweatshirt on and so what i decided to do is since i heard that he was going to be at memphis comic con and have a booth and everything I got that single issue. I found it at one of my local comic shops. Got that Perfect. single issue. I got the I'm Not Daredevil sweatshirt, the red sunglasses, the candy cane, like everything that Matt nice. Murdock wears in that image. And I showed up at his table wearing that costume. And he loved it so much that he got up immediately and took a picture with me. I Not, e- not even like oh, with awesome. my with my camera. It was um, either his wife or whoever was with him at the time, like had yeah. a dslr camera and and took a picture of it i don't know what they did with that photo but yeah it was really cool he was a really nice and approachable guy and they decided the the issue yeah oh yeah yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so he was i i I enjoyed it and i thought it was was just like you it it was one of you know the highlights of my life is being able to talk to him and that do that i think you know i don't know how many people have done that with him before but i had a lot of fun doing it and just the fact that he got up immediately and it would seem, you know, really pleasantly surprised and, ex- and excited about that, I think mm-hmm. said volumes of it. So Absolutely. yeah, it's just, it's really cool. And I, I agree the the creators in the comics industry, you know, kind of depending on who they are, some of them who are, you know, at the, um, at the high end, you know, are a little bit harder to get be- just because there's so sure, much in demand, sure. but there are some people who are even at that level that, um, are very approachable on social media. And if they have the time, you know, they seem like they, they're they interested in wanting to reach back out to the fans and stuff like that. And so I agree with you. That's something that surprised me as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I found that, um, <clears throat> that up-and-comers are usually very eager to talk. Mm-hmm. And why, hey, why wouldn't they be? Like, you're um, talented, you're up-and-coming, let me help you in that journey in my own small way. And then right. maybe people that are a little past 
their prime in terms of public perception. You know what okay. I mean? Yeah. Older writers, um, and I, I hate. I don't. I hope I don't sound ageist when I say that. But people that are just not the flavor of the month anymore. Right. Um, and it happens. You know, yeah. it's not like uh, these folks are putting out. You know, and I'll just pick on uh, uh, John Mark Demattius, but uh, you know, he's an amazing writer, storied mm-hmm. career. Um, is he headlining Amazing Spider-Man anymore? No, that's okay. He's still got plenty of good stuff to give. He's just out of the spotlight right now. Right. Um, yeah, like I love chit chatting with those people because again, the longer their career, the more stories they have. Right. Oh yeah. So yeah, uh, you can totally be down to stuff like that. Oh yeah. So what's been the most difficult and or rewarding aspect of running Comic Watch as editor in chief? Well, at the end of the day. It's a double-edged sword because I have at the end of the day, it, it's the buck stops with me mm-hmm. and I got to make sure the trains roll on time. Right. Now, I've got a really good staff of editors that, that volunteer with me um, that, that help me out. But at the end of the day, I'm the one paying the bills. I'm the one making sure that this, that, or the other gets done on time. Look, it's the burden of being the guy at the top. I, <laughs> I, 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 I like it. Um, but it can be, you know, it can burn you out too. Like there's times where I'm just like, I gotta write the schedule again. Okay. <laughs> I guess the site should probably have stuff to, to, to publish tomorrow. Right. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, here's the thing, you know, I work a full-time job. I have a family, I have other interests, but I need to also be the guy with the vision board it's like, okay, this is where we need to go in three, six, three or six months or a year from now mm-hmm. and start trying to push things in a certain direction. Right. Um, and it doesn't always work because here's the thing. And this is where that double-edged sword comes in. When you have a staff of all volunteers, my leverage for being like, dude, I need this done is not there. Right. You know, I have to, I have to be able to offer goodwill and carrots and <laughs> and attaboys um for for moving the ball for you know earlier this year we had um uh a celebration for the 30th anniversary of image called image 30 and every week we were rolling out um a look back at certain comics that built image okay well earlier this summer um i i came down with covid now I'm I'm boosted. I'm uh, I'm vaxxed. So fortunately, it was I was just down and out for maybe four days total. But when I got back, like all the long long COVID stuff was there. I was fatigued all the time. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't remember anything for shit. And my ability to keep these articles going just wasn't there. Well, if I'm the only one that's like truly passionate about the Image Thirty project, and everyone else is just kind of like. Yeah, I can help out when you get to this book in November because I like this comic and want to talk about it. Well, that's fine, but it doesn't keep us, you know, in uh, in articles a week at a time until then. And, and unfortunately, the project just kind of fell by the wayside. So, you know, next year um, we've got the 30th anniversary of Vertigo Comics. Mm. Um, I want to kind of do something similar the image 30, but maybe with a less intensive every week uh, schedule that that way it be, if it's less, <clears throat> excuse me, less time consuming on the team when we're writing these articles. So um, that's, you know, a little bit of a peek forward. Um, I'm really wanting to continue to push forward the LGBTQ content because we mm-hmm. do, like you've talked about diversity, well, we have a pretty strong presence in that community. Mm-hmm. Um, it certainly doesn't hurt that we have a lot of writers, a lot of passionate and skilled writers that hail from that community as well. And they, you know, they bring perspectives that I can't bring. So when, what, <clears throat> what happens is, um, I can be the biggest ally in the world, but I will never have the personal perspective to talk about um, 
uh, T. Franklin's uh, I, Har- Harley and Ivy type stuff, you know. Right. Uh, so when the when members of that particular team are unable to get stuff in, then our uh, our presence in terms of that representation kind of does fall by the wayside a little bit because we're not continuous with it like I would like us to be. But again, when you're talking about an all volunteer organization, I don't, you know, there's only so many carrots that I have. I right. can't be like, well, you're going to get fired. Well, okay. <laughs> Who gives a shit? You're not paying me anyway. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's again, it that's that's where you come down with the the labor of love stuff. And you've got to be realistic with people. People have lives. They're doing this. Um they're volunteering for the site because they want to give back to the community as well. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, real life has to come first though. People get sick, kids get sick, life, life happens. And, um, you know, we just push on, we just keep on keeping on. We've got a wonderful, uh, like you said, we've got a wonderfully diverse group of writers, um, that bring all kinds of awesome perspectives to the table. And so anytime that I, you know, maybe something doesn't quite work out the way I would hope, I'm just happy that the folks that are, that are writing and are, are contributing are writing and contributing because um, it, there's a damn good group of people there. And oh. I'm, I guess I'm very humbled to serve as their editor in chief. Yeah. Well, and, and I got to say, uh, that's one of the things I absolutely love and impressed by with Comic Watch is the fact that it's a volunteer, because just like we said, there's no compensation. So you're motivated and we're all intrinsically motivated and doing a good job and we're not doing it for the money. So the fact yeah. that Comic Watch puts out so much great stuff and it's all because people are wanting to contribute that and they don't get anything in return. And just as you said, there's no um, you know, recompense or compensation or anything like that. And this is just all because we are loving this community and that we want to put that out there. I think it just makes it even more impressive when you look at some of the other websites that do freelance model and do, you know, pay per article type of thing. I think that speaks volumes of people um, who read Comic Watch is that they can enjoy it and know that this is coming from the heart and that it's not being yeah. written with a certain angle because we're trying to get clicks or anything like that. But this is because we're reviewing this comic or we're writing this article because we're really passionate about that sort of thing. And I, I think that's one of the things that comic watch just makes it special. And what makes it so impressive is how great of a website it is. And you all, you know, continuing that and supporting that. And we have a pretty good following that people really enjoy the stuff that we're putting Mm -hmm. out there, you know, just because we have great people that's on the staff that's doing it for free because they love it, you know? And, and I think that's been really impressive with this website and with this organization. Well, I, I I appreciate it. And uh, I know the rest, rest of the team appreciates it as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I didn't start this site. I, I was, uh, as a matter of fact, nobody that started this site is left is still here. Wow. Um, I got, I got headhunted a little bit, um, from, uh, various Facebook groups, people, uh, that preceded me, um, like, um, Cody White, who's now an editor at Valiant, mm-hmm. um, kind of hit reached out and like, Hey, uh, you know, you, you talk a pretty good game. You're well-spoken and pretty knowledgeable here in these Facebook groups. Would you ever consider writing for our site? We're not going to pay you, but do you want to do it? <laughs> yeah. Let's I'll see what's up with this. And from there, um, it's, it's just grown really organically and, um, people come and gone. Um, I've, I've made people that even though I've never met them in real life, I consider them my, my, my dear friends and, um, comic watch is just part of my DNA now. Like, Mm I don't think I could walk away if I, if I wanted to. So, (laughs) um, sorry if, uh, if, if, if you guys were listening and you're like, God, I wish this guy would shut up and go away. Um, (laughs) but I I don't think I'm going anywhere now. Look, I'm not going to lie. If Image called me tomorrow or, or Skybound and was like, Matt, we would like to offer you an assistant editor position. I'm done. Like, y'all can, <laughs> here, Sean, you're in charge. Um, right. <laughs> but, but the odds of that happening are quite slim. Right. Uh, even though we do have a good good thing going with, with Skybound. They really like us. Oh, yeah. We 
templates of their stuff. But, right. um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I say that in jest, you know, we have had a couple different folks move uh, from our site to, to the big leagues. Um, mm-hmm. My predecessor as uh, editor in chief, Nicholas Osborne, um, he got hired on at Valiant and then Cody White also went to Valiant. Um, some of our past writers went on to paying reviewed jobs at some of the other sites mm-hmm. uh, or I hate to call them competitor sites because they're really not competitor. They're doing something very different than we are. But right. um, I mean, again, if that's that's your trajectory to go for it, I'm not going to. I'm not going to stop you or shame you or, you know, whatever it's, Mm -hmm. it's all. Um, yeah. yeah. So doors do open by writing for our site. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a great way to think of it because comic Watts can really be a great stepping stone into those places. So especially when I don't know for our listeners, if they realize that a lot of places like that, that are looking for writers for, paid or freelance they're looking for people when they submit the their application for it for samples of work and i remember yeah. when i first started like i didn't have any of that to show off like i never did a formal review or anything like that and so comic watch is a great way to do it because Thank again it's you know how to write yeah <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> I, I, I've, I've had to turn down applications because the person is clearly passionate, but mm-hmm. has no clue how to write. Right. And yeah. they learned how to write from, from Twitter. And <laughs> thank you so much for your passion, but we're going to go in another way. Right. Um, right. So it goes, right? Yeah. Um, you know, in, in the past, we've had a lot of a stronger anime presence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, in terms of reviews, um, unfortunately, we're not touching them at all right now. We just haven't had folks that are uh, that are that have been that have hit us up to open that door a little bit for us again. But right. um, yeah, you know, if anybody out there want, is down with anime and wants to review random stuff for us, by all means, hit us up. Yeah, um, I would say anybody that is wanting to be a, a passionate essayist. Mm-hmm. and get some stuff out there hit us up i will tell you this um we are lacking a lot of pers- uh, perspectives from um the black community mm-hmm. so that's 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 a miss for us so again if you're a, if you're a black nerd hit us up man we'd love to we'd love to chat and get you on board because um, again it goes back to being authentic like i was saying about uh the lgbtq community earlier like I can't, I, I'm totally your ally, but I, I can't get right for that perspective. So right. having those, giving space to those voices is so, so important for who we are as a site. Agreed. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and one of the things I also wanted to mention as, as you talked about, um, you know, how we haven't had anime, um, it, it reminds me that Comic Watch isn't just comics, though. We, we don't do just comics reviews. We also do, right. just as you say, Anime, we have a media team that do reviews for yeah. TV and film. Uh, I know we do press releases from time to time or previews and things like that. But there, it, it pretty much it kind of expands out from not just comics, but into pop culture. And I know we have uh, Mike who does, I think he does like VH, VHS specials or kind of like the classic films and things like that. Well, yeah, Mike, yeah. So yeah, Mike Spring, one of our regular columnists, um, mm-hmm. he's got a column that comes out every Tuesday at uh, noon Eastern, and it, it's called What's New on Home Video, which is, of course, right. kind of tongue-in-cheek because what's home video anymore? But <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, like the week's new releases for Blu-ray or what have you. He does mm-hmm. a rundown on them, and like he's he knows his stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, can, like There's a lot of detail and knowledge put in there. He always embeds like the preview videos, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. uh the trailers for everything i should say and he's not shy with his opinions and sometimes yeah. they're quite comical spoiler <laughs> warning he does not like jordan peele movies <laughs> uh, <laughs> like somebody out there had to not but right. um, yeah that's a pretty cool one um so yeah man yeah. um we've also got kickstarter corner that we run mm-hmm. on saturdays for our small press saturday which uh highlights well, you guessed it up and coming kickstarters that are out there that way we're given a little bit of voice to um 
well, not just necessarily new talent because Kickstarter is used by everybody now, Mm -hmm. including like big names like Scott Snyder. Yeah. um, Which is just tells you a lot about how Kickstarter has evolved in the last like four or five years. But yes. (laughs) um, And I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Right. To be honest with you. Um, yeah, it, <laughs> that's it's definitely changed a, whole a lot. Episode. Yeah, <laughs> that's a whole nother episode. <laughs> but um, yeah, we've got that. Um, we have in the past, and and they're kind of in a, the writers kind of in a position where they're not able to contribute right now. But um, author Bethany Pope um, has had a column called "The Pope's Comics" mm-hmm. um, in the back in, in in recent months, and they're on a little bit of a hiatus right now. Um, just for personal reasons, but, um, yeah, you know, Bethany is a, is a poet and a comics nerd and a published author, like God, three times over now, novelist. Mm-hmm. So, um, that's been a really cool thing and, and new voices and, and new ideas are always just popping off for us. Mm-hmm. Um, that's also the nice thing about having our own site and kind of being a little more of a DIY site is we can just try some stuff. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't hit, it doesn't hit. Right. No, no. We'll just go on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, the only <laughs> thing we lost was time. <laughs> right. So it goes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and and I think that's, you know, that that speaks volumes about Comic Watch, even though, you know, that's kind of our bread and butter. We're also open to trying out new things. And, mm-hmm. and if you have something that you think would be a really cool idea that fits into this sort of um genre that we're writing into i mean we're very open to trying that out i know you know from time to time we even do like top five lists or things like that or even like a blast from the past type of thing where if a movie's coming out i know we did um i did an article a while back about uh like the top five bat gadgets with the um just in time for the batman uh movie coming out and so i did you know my favorite ones that came out and so there's a lot of opportunities of writing things that you know that you might be passionate about that might not fit in terms of reviewing comics, but still fits within the audience and with the mission and uh, vision Mm -hmm. of comic watch as well, too. Well, and on the media side of the house, um, we've recently kind of started branching into stage and costuming a little bit. Um, Yeah. Christian has been bringing a lot of really cool articles and ideas on, on that. Frankly, I never even occurred to me to do so, but, just outside of my wheelhouse right those have been great and then every monday um we have uh 11 eastern we have patricia high smash now patricia high smash is frankly and I'm, i'm biased but um it's probably my favorite regular feature that we do because um travis who writes it has such a deep and unique perspective on anything and everything that fits into the the pop cultural me- melting pot that mm-hmm. they that they write about and um if i mean morrison bob dylan um <laughs> new x-men Mor- morrison's new x-men recently had an extended look back from various angles and peek under the covers Next year, we're going to be diving into um, 52 chapters, uh, Decoding the Invisibles, also by Morrison. Oh, wow. So, yes, that is coming up. Um, But, man, there's just not much at all that Travis doesn't write about with with very well thought out viewpoints and perspectives. And having them writing for our site um, is, is really just incredible because mm-hmm. they're such a talented writer. Right. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you very much for talking about Comic Watch. And this is really appropriate to have you on this episode because we're trying something out differently with this show right. that we haven't done before. And I'm really excited about it. And I hope everyone who's listening will be excited about this as well, too. Um, but at the end of every episode, before I wrap up with our guests, I am planning on doing a segment with the guests called, you know, what are we reading? Basically, I, I got to come up with a better name for it. But basically, we're going to talk about what comics are we currently reading. And I also am planning on doing a um you know, call for other people on social media. So, you know, TikTok and Twitter and Instagram and all that to share what they are reading. And we'll also mention that on the episode as well, too. So to kick things off, 
what are you currently reading in the comics world, Matt? What is your oh, um, run or issue that you are at least wanting to start or maybe you're currently in the middle yeah. of? <laughs> uh, well, we'll bring it full circle. I love everything about the current Krakoa era of X-Men. <laughs> um, Which I knew because we had a whole conversation in Slack because I am very yeah, lost. I love it, but very lost. And you're like, I, I don't want to read a hundred comics to get to <laughs> <laughs> this point now. i get it but i even read the the huge thick book of the house of x and powers of 10 and i'm still lost in some of this stuff it's it's exciting and it's, it's it interesting is. but i'm still lost on some of this i, I honestly <laughs> and i mean you know again full circle i've been reading x-men for as long as i've been reading comics um this the current era since 2019 i've never seen the entire line that was this high quality. Mm -hmm. It's bursting with ideas. They are kicking down all the preconceived notions of what anything with mm -hmm. X-Men is. And they're succeeding. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. I mean, they're on year three of this experiment with Krakoa and Destiny of X and all that right now, right? Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And they are just blowing the doors off of everything and everyone's expectations. And um, the X-Men's place in the Marvel Universe is completely changed. I mean, yeah. what, it, what these books are is currently honoring the past, but it's moving the narrative into a 21st century perspective on um, what it is to be a minority in the world. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> really having a new conversation with readers about, well, you know, our old way of looking at things is we just want people to like us for who we are and then we can all get along. And that's a cool analogy for, you know, 50 years ago. And I, it's not a bad one either. I'm not, I'm not saying that by any stretch of the imagination, but now we're, we're getting a little more aggressive with our stance and we're, we're saying, this is who I am. I don't care if you like it or not. I'm here <laughs> and I'm I'm not going anywhere. Right. That that to me is a more bold stance, especially if you're talking about the the mutants as being an analogy or a metaphor, I should say, for oppressed people the world over. Mm -hmm. So that that right there, I mean, is just huge. Yeah. Um, I I'm digging on anything and everything that Chip Zdarsky writes. Yes. Uh, if you're not reading, um, shoot, what am I trying to spit out now? I just went blank on the name. Oh my gosh. Um, if you're not reading Daredevil, that's not what I was going to say, but <laughs> his Daredevil is pretty amazing too. Mm -hmm. um, Darede this is easily the best Daredevil. Um, yes. In, I don't know. I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to say he's better than Mark <laughs> I know how you feel about that run, but um, it it's legit. It it's it's fantastic. Run. And the yeah. thing that here's here's what Zadarsky's done in this run that's worked so well is he's taking all the familiar pieces, you know, Daredevil, Kingpin, Electra, Bullseye, and he's turning their roles mm -hmm. on their head. Right. Right. You know, it starts off, you know, Daredevil can't figure out how to be daredevil anymore because he accidentally killed somebody right um he's feeling like he's more of a criminal than a hero mm -hmm. electra is trying to figure out how to be a hero uh and atone for her past kingpin is trying to figure out how to be legitimate <laughs> and it's like all these familiar pieces but they're turned at a, at a 90 degree angle so that you just don't know what to expect yes and just as a lifelong daredevil fan um I, I have to say, I am just thrilled that comic is at the top of my to read list every month when it comes out. Yes. Um, God. And, and I, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to um, that Texas Blood by Chris Condon and Jacob Phillips. If you like crime uh, and crime fiction, my goodness, you could. It, it's, it's a 10 out of 10 every issue. Yeah. Yeah. Just and it's hilarious too. Like there are some really good, funny panels that they have in there that are just hysterical. I, I, I've read, I think, um, 
maybe the first few issues, but I absolutely mm-hmm. love it just because of what you said. It's a great mystery, right? I yeah. think it's like the first six issues that that they wrote, and it's a great mystery. It's a great detective, but it has a lot of um, really interesting twists and turns, and just funny moments that it's mm-hmm. just kind of it's kind of the the dark humor. So if you're not a fan of dark humor it's it's definitely leans into that but if you like dark humor it does a really good job yeah. of leaning into it really well yeah i i enjoy that too yeah if, if you like um if you like fargo i would say yes that's a pretty and a pretty good one-to-one for what's going on in that texas sport yeah oh yeah definitely well and, definitely. and going back to what you're talking about with zadarsky um he's currently writing batman and um, the one that I've been wanting to read because I've heard nothing but great things, and I think Zdarsky did a great job with doing you know PR on it is Public Domain. That's what I was trying to say. I out. thought maybe I that's thought, what it was. was. Like, public, <laughs> and like my brain kept trying to say Public Image. No, that's not right. But yes, <laughs> Public uh, Public Domain is it's he's doing the whole thing. He's writing, drawing, lettering, coloring. I don't know when this man sleeps, um, <laughs> but. It, it's the ultimate love letter to creators yes. of comics. Yes. And the yeah. act of yeah. creating a comic. And yeah, it's it it's got Eisner bait written all over it. <laughs> 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 because it's it's just so damn good. Oh yeah. Oh, my gosh, man. Um, well, and and when he was promoting it, he did something really genius that I it's hysterical, but just Again, it tells you how genius he is as a writer because what he did was he took actual um, quotes that he got from other writers when he asked them to review it and put that out there and put it on, I think, on back of his issues or trade paperbacks of like, I I forget what it was, but I think maybe uh, Gail Simone had said something. And it's just something as simple as like, I don't have time for this, you know? Yes. (laughs) It's like, actually. (laughs) Yeah. And they all loved it. Yeah. It's it's so interesting. Yeah. Um. Are you so, something of a uh, an aside? Um, are you reading Crossover by Donny Cates? I am not. No. No. There's an issue after the first arc wraps that is guest written by Zdarsky, and Whoa. the whole thing is him lampooning his public persona. But he's doing it in this really tragic way, and I, yeah. I don't want to get into it too much because it plays into the ultimate story that's happening in Crossover. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like you, I want to say it's issue seven. Um, read it, just yeah. read. It. Yeah, <laughs> it's brilliant. It'll, it'll be it'll be on on top of my other you know to read pile as well too. Dude, yeah. <laughs> oh, let me just tell you, I I okay. So when COVID first started in twenty spring twenty twenty and everything was shutting down, of course my LCS was shutting down. Oh my gosh, we don't know how long we're not going to have fun. So I like stocked up on stuff to read. Right. And and a lot of it is still to be read. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's my own fault because I keep throwing more logs on the fire. And so, ooh, yeah, back issues. And ooh, trades. I was going to read that. <laughs> and, and yeah, like I'm, oh, I'm so bad. My, I know. I, I think wife, all of us are. I, I, I think there's that, there's that very, whole phrase. very patient. Oh, that's great. You can say. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I think they say that, you know, you're not a comic book reader unless you have a, you know, um, to read pile. Right. Because everybody has that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it got really bad when I got hooked on um, buying buying an yeah, omnibus. Yeah, because I'm a sucker for <laughs> getting the whole story in one cover. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm also a sucker for just being able to sit down and read like all of this silver age fantastic four that I will never be able to afford. You know, right. there's a, there's a, my inner historian is, is being, um, is, is at play with my inner comics nerd and, and they're, they just teamed up and now I have something like close to 20 omnibuses on top of my trades, on top <laughs> of my single issues, which could fill a long box that yeah. I'm I, like, someday I'm going to get through it all. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I hope unless I get hit by a, a truck tomorrow, which fingers crossed I won't. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I've got plenty, but you know, one of, <clears throat> one, one of the reasons, and, and again, I, I don't want to get too far afield, but one of the reasons that I really, really have gotten into the omnibus is that historical perspective right mm-hmm. like 
you could reasonably paint yourself a picture of what Silver Age Marvel was all about with mm-hmm. these purchases and do so for a relatively reasonable price and not having to uh, spend years doing it. Right. Um, same thing with, um, you know, Golden Age DC or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if when you're, <clears throat> when there, there's something of a scholarly aspect to it that I just really enjoy being able to have that understanding of where we've been in the past with comics. And because of course it informs where we are now, right? Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> that's that's my weakness is wanting to know more. Right. That. Yep. Um, well, I know I am starting a new series. I've been collecting them. I haven't started yet. Um, and so I am planning on starting Dark Knights of Steel because for those of you who don't know, they plub us all the way up to like issue seven. And then there was just a huge break. And it's written by Tom Taylor, if I remember correctly. Yes. And there wasn't a new issue. And, and they said they were putting out 12 issues. There was a new one. They haven't really said much. And then now they're it starting came it back out up. this past week. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. now that that issue came out, I'm like, I'm going to sit down and start reading through them because then I'll be caught up and be able to, you know, read them as they come back in. And the next thing I'm going to read after that is actually preparation for one of the episodes that we're doing um, coming soon is some of the holiday comics I have um, in my shelf that I'm going to be reading. So um, Claus from, um, I I don't know if they pronounce it Claus or Klaus, but from um, Dan Mora and Grant Morrison, I got a couple of those books and they're really great. They've been my favorite so far. Mm -hmm. Um, The Batman Catwoman holiday special that they have and Batman Noel. So I got that ready to go as well. Yeah. So, and I haven't read, I read um, one of the books for Klaus, but the other books I have not read yet. So they're going to be brand new to me. I don't know what to expect going in. And so um, I don't have much to say other than I'm very excited about those. (laughs) Man, anytime Morrison does something new, I'm, I'm going to check it out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're one of my favorite writers period. Um, They wrote some of my favorite comics of all time, Doom Patrol, Animal Man, JLA, Mm -hmm. uh, Invisibles. And plenty of other stuff that I just adore. Like they're they're just that right one of those writers that I do not miss. Right. Whenever they come out with something new. Period. Right. Now yeah. look, it may not always be my cup of tea. I wasn't a fan of Proctor Road. Um, it just didn't grab me. Uh, and then um any of this any of excuse me, any of their stuff that really starts dipping into um Hinduism. Okay. It's just I just I kind of just blank on it. It's, it's like, you're very clearly passionate about this, and I'm not. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, so it goes. Right. It, all, no one writer is always going to grab you with everything that they put out. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I, you know, that's, I think we've all said that's the beauty of comic books is that there's something for everyone out there. And, you know, it there's comics don't have to be you know, for a, a particular run does have to be for everybody, you yeah, know? And so yeah. there's something out there. If you don't like this one, you can try something else out and, and you'll probably like that one. So, yeah. You got it. Well, um, here are what some of our uh, listeners have been uh, reading. So from our Comic Watch team, uh, Dustin, is it Gebel or Gable? Uh, Gable. Gable, Dustin okay. Gable. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Uh, Dustin Gable said, just finished reading Supper Club by Jackie Morrow from Image. It was a mouth-watering story of human connections made through food and was a visual treat that leaves the reader wanting seconds and thirds. Just a fun, compelling read with gorgeous descriptions of food and friendships that offers comfort in a chaotic time. I have not heard about this, but this makes me want to eat food now. <laughs> um, yes, we did run We did run the reviews on it. Um, mm-hmm. Or maybe it was the review of the trade. I forget. Uh, uh, it's and I'm going blank on who reviewed it right now, but <laughs> they really, really liked it. Um, yeah. It's it's very much a comic that is like you subscribed. Um, it's for foodies and it's about people. Right. And I like that a lot because food is where human connections are made. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, not solely obviously but like there's a reason why when you go on a date with somebody you have dinner with them right there's a reason why you have family meal time right right there's just something about food 
that lends itself to that human connection. And yeah, the fact that there's a comic about it, hell yeah. Again, yeah. like you said, <laughs> there's comics for everybody. Yeah. Well, and, 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 you know, on top of that, when you look at religion, every religion has something to connect with food in some, you know, in some way, basically, you know, Absolutely. whether it's, it's dietary restrictions or if it's, you know, I, I grew up Catholic and, you know, when you go to mass, it, you know, the second half of that service is about the last supper and, you know, all that. And so that's centered around food. And so every religion has something that, um, you know, something to say about food and how that's a part of their uh, culture and their theology as well, too. So yeah, you're exactly right. It's, it's food is definitely ingrained as part of the human experience in some way. So um, Ross Hutchinson said Minor Threats is a comic that he's reading and that it's a comic about C-class villains that has no right to be this compelling, but that's exactly what it is. Through a switch up in first person narration and digging into the flawed, often tragic past of the characters, Jordan Bloom and Patton Oswalt, put a very human and compelling face on characters we would usually laugh off and scoff at then is combined with over the top superhero situation hijinks brought to life by gloriously detailed and colored art by Scott Hepburn and Ian Herring that amps up the traditional superhero tropes to 11 and it's published by Dark Horse Comics again i have not heard of this before but just on his description alone it's probably something I'm going to check out Ross, now. Yeah, Ross loves his run-on sentences. <laughs> yeah. It's Ross. a little bit, yeah. I've been him for years. Um, but it's good. It's good, no, yeah. Yeah, Ross, it, it is a kick-ass comic. Issue three comes out uh, this week. You know, oftentimes when people from other media dip their pinky toe into comics, the mm -hmm. results can be mixed. Um, Pat Oswalt very freaking clearly knows his shit. Mm -hmm. And... Just buy this comic. I, I'm not <laughs> sure how many issues it's going to be. Um, four, six, 12, who knows? But buy it while you can. Um, do not trade weight on this. It's badass. Right. Uh, from our Discord, and when I say our, it's it's a Discord that I run with a couple friends of mine. Um, nice. Lauren said, Poison Ivy is one of the best books right now. Top three, if not number one. Issue six was fantastic, and I'm so hyped for the next arc. Ivy is finally being told as a 3T character she is, and I absolutely agree. I remember reviewing Poison Ivy, I think number three or number four, four comic watch and Oops. after reading it i already put the trade paperback into my uh wish list to pick up at my local comic shop because this is a fantastic issue that i read and i couldn't agree more that this is probably one of the best uh storytelling of, of poison ivy and i think it's written by uh g willow wilson i believe yes yeah. yes and it, it's it's i couldn't agree more it's definitely um does justice to poison ivy as a character that's what I keep hearing. I haven't read it myself, but again, mm -hmm. G. Willow Wilson, um, at some point I'll get to it. Yeah. <laughs> Just oh, yeah. Those things. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, yeah. And it, 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 it's worth noting, um, this was originally only conceived and pitched as a six issue mini, and it yes. was on strength of sales that it was, uh, to use a Hollywood term, optioned as an ongoing. Yeah. So oh, yeah. That, that says a lot right there. Definitely. Yeah. I oh, know. And I, I remember how, how it, you know, it's typically, and especially when you're looking at Marvel, um, they won't, they'll be cagey about it and not say one way or another, whether something's ongoing or not. And then it'll suddenly be, Oh, it's the last issue. And uh, we planned it as a mini all along and <laughs> um, stop lying. But <laughs> yeah, I, I just love that because so many of our comics now and i mean look this is part of the changing landscape i'm not knocking or anything but so many comics are miniseries right now like i get frustrated as a reader mm -hmm. because i'll read about this kick-ass sounding new series and then i'll find out after the fact that oh it's going to be a miniseries it's only six issues right shit i could have just waited for the trade you right. know and i yeah. hate I, Sometimes being a trade waiter is fine, but um, when you've got 50 long boxes worth of comics, like I have to be economical with what I'm buying at the shop. <laughs> yeah. So definitely. it's something that I can wait another six, seven, <coughs> excuse me, eight months and get in a trade, I'll suck it up and buy it. Right, right. 
Um, Joe Loves Comics said, I haven't been able to pick up this week's books yet, but I've started reading the first Walking Dead compendium, and it's been great so far. I did get Giant Days Volume 5 a few days ago, and that series continues to be such a delight. Well worth a read if anyone hasn't already. I will say I have not heard Giant Days before. Never heard and of that. I've, Who's I've, the Do we know? Uh, didn't say. Not sure. Um, and in terms of Walking Dead, I am not a zombie type of person. So, you know, things sure. like this and Marvel zombies and deceased, um, it just never really interested me because it's not my thing. But I know a lot of people have really enjoyed, you know, those kind of, obviously Walking feelings. Dead is, is a TV series and all that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So Giant Days, um, it's YA. Okay. YA, for the older set of YA, 13 to 18. Um, I know there's a term for that, but I don't. Uh, it appears to be self-published via Kickstarter. Okay. Um, in a lot of ways, but... That makes sense, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It looks it looks interesting anyway. Um, yeah. But yeah, totally cool. Again, comics are for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, from Twitter, Ken from the ODPH podcast said Barnstormers number three by Scott Snyder and Tula Lote. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly for Comixology and Best Jacket Press. The high flying duo story keeps getting better. Uh, and Ken says he has a few theories about it, but doesn't want to spoil anything. Um, I've also heard really good things about Barnstormers by them. It's, it's I, I haven't Scott read Snyder. it. Um, I'd yeah. be very shocked if it, if it wasn't good. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I've read anything of his that wasn't good as well. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's so definitely one I need to check out at some point. Yeah. Um, sure. So wizard podcast said Savage Avengers, awesome comic with a great cast of characters, best Marvel book on the shelves. And absolutely agree that it's a great story we had david on the show before the writer david peppos and yeah. and talk about that a little bit and it's honestly savage avengers as an idea of a team never interested me but i love david's stuff and so i gave it a shot and he has done a fantastic job of taking that property and make it really cool really interesting and keeping on the edge of your seat because they, he's done some great things that i don't think they have attempted with savage avengers in the past and it's just phenomenal i absolutely love it Dude, it's my favorite Marvel book right now. <laughs> yeah. It is. Oh, yeah. <coughs> excuse me. It is probably the most Marvel Marvel book being published right now. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Suppose is he's clearly got a really deep knowledge of Marvel hit lore. Oh, yeah. And it shows because yeah. there are deep cuts upon deep cuts upon deep cuts throughout the whole freaking comic. Mm -hmm. And the. He's taking a kitchen sink approach with the characters that yes could have backfired really easily because mm -hmm. they're you know they're a real hodgepodge of characters, but they're that it they're just gelling perfectly, and that's a testament to his skill as a writer. Yes, um, and you know it kind of sucks that the first arc they had to resolve getting uh, Conan back to Hyperborea right. because he was losing the license. Right, but super fun story, and now they're hanging out in 2099. Yeah, um, <laughs> that last page of the most recent issue was like, oh, yes. So, oh, um, yeah. yeah, and then I I've been a huge fan of the artist Carlos Magno since um he, wrote, oh, yeah. he drew um Invaders, which was by Chip Zdarsky, mm -hmm. and um yeah, that that dude is next level. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, so, and and David, I thought did a fantastic job of wrapping up Conan's uh, story, and um, and it just just beautifully, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a it was a lyric like issue five, which is the conclusion of that story was was lyrically written. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I I absolutely love it. And again, I'm not somebody I I've ever really had any interest in Conan, but yeah, in yeah. this story, he a fantastic job. And I think this is his first Marvel story too. So the fact that he's been reviving it's Savage Avengers. Marvel story, but it's his first, um, he has, I mean, he's had some stuff pop up um, in like anthology type books. Right. Right. Very exactly. recently, like just in the last year, but oh, this yeah. is his first monthly. And right. um, yeah, dude's just crushing it. Yes, I won't be shocked, Sean, when he's writing one of the key X Men books within three years. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. He, yeah, he's just been doing a phenomenal job with that. I agree. 
Um, on TikTok, Travel Beef said Chip Zdarsky's Batman so far. He's enjoying a lot of the Silver Age uh, callbacks, and Bruce finally admitting that the Robins are his sons. Um, and again, Zdarsky's Batman has just been a really fun to entertain. We we're talking about Daredevil, but Batman is, has just that much of a level as well too. And I agree exactly with that. It's it's been fantastic mm-hmm. to read, and and he's bringing in a lot of interesting characters that you would think it wouldn't work, but actually works really well with what he's doing with it. And, and each issue has been actually ending with some sort of side story a little bit. And I've been noticing yes. that DC comics has been doing that. Cause I just finished reading Joker, the man who stopped laughing and they did the same thing as well too, is that they ended like the last six pages was almost like a, a side story, but that kind of fits into the overall, um, you know, universe a little bit yes. or the overall, you know, theme of it, but does it, I don't think it's directly, a part of the main story. Um, and so it's, I think it's really interesting what they're doing, but yeah, I, I agree. A lovely, lovely comic book and, and run that he's been doing a great job with as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's um, a spiritual successor to uh, the tower of Babel story from Mark Wade's opening gambit on a, a run, excuse me, opening run on JLA. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's tapping into Morrison's time on Batman with Zoran R. So uh, just, again, being able to call back to those stories without necessarily making it feel like they're just sounding a bell that's already been rung is uh, really cool. Really, really cool. It's rewarding for long term readers. Right. Oh, yeah, I agree. And then um, our last comment is from Instagram from. A uh, Ling Saniza, which I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly as well, too. Um, just read Batgirls number 10 by Becky Clunan and Michael Conrad. The writing and art are playful, dynamic, which appealed to me as a casual comics reader. I didn't have to deep dive into everyone's backstory, could simply sit back and enjoy the witty banner and beautifully rendered panels. I have to say, I've only read one issue of Batgirls. I um, didn't like it. <laughs> I Yeah, I didn't like it. Did, did you say you didn't like it? No, you didn't like it. I did not like it. You're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know you didn't like it. I re- <laughs> I uh, edited your review. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it, well, it's, and, and it's, it's hard fun, as a reviewer. A it's, comic. Say what? It's a fun comic. Yeah. It's yeah. not super deep. Um, and I think you definitely hit a nail on the head with your review of it that it, it is definitely geared more for younger readers. Right. When I say younger, I mean like little kids, but maybe you know, teens, tweens, whatever. Exactly. Um, and that's what that's what I said in my review because we're, I said we're, we're all listen, we're we're old, man. We don't <laughs> we, we barely understand how, how the tickety talk works. Um, <laughs> and and but the thing that's kind of got me, like I I like the writing. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the art style. Like right. I know it's been several different artists throughout. I, um, Jorge Corona did the first arc, and then right. Neil Good jumped in, and I don't remember who did the last couple of issues. But it's just not my cup of tea. Right. Like I, I come more from the Neil Adams, Jim Lee side of the street when it comes to art, as right. opposed to the cartoonier side of the of the art street. Right. That's yeah. Nothing wrong with it. It's just not for me. Right. Um, but exactly. Anything that um, that that Clunrad touches, I'm going to check out. Right. They are just a wonderful uh, writing com duo. Right. Right. Yeah. What, and that's why I said in my review. And 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 to preface this, I think as a comics reviewer, it's really hard to dive into the middle of the story and do a review a hundred percent justice because when you go in blind and not knowing like anything that happened up to, or the backstory, you're really just relying on your experience with this one issue. And, yes. and, and that's why I said my challenging re- review. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why I said in my review is that, you know, I think if this was definitely geared towards, you know, uh, tweeners and teenagers, like, I think it was a great story actually. And that's what it seemed like it was written for. And so if that was the case, then I, hundred percent. This, this was a great story and she did a fantastic job of writing it. But if it was supposed to be for like an older um, audience, like it just did not click for me. And and that's, and that's why I was like, you know, again, I didn't know 
if that's what it's geared for and that's what it's tended to be. So if it is, then, you know, right. she nailed it perfectly. And just like we said with the art, for me, there was a lot of, um, I, I call it Nickelodeon style type of animation where it's uh, the background, like the entire background is, oh, looks like it has like a green or purple overlay on it. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it helps I, pop I out. The, yeah. Yeah. And it helps pop mm -hmm. out the characters a little bit, but um, it just, again, like what you said and, and what I said as well too, that art style just isn't for me and, and it's not clicking for me, but again, you know, if it's for a younger audience and I think it really hits it pretty well. And, and if you're, mm -hmm. if you're older and you enjoy it, I am really happy that you enjoy it. It just did not click for me. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, look, um, if, if you're wanting to read some damn good uh, stuff with spoiler, I would highly recommend checking out um, her turn as um, Batgirl. That mm -hmm. is been collected, I think, just last year across two different trades. It's around about a 25 issue run. I can't remember the exact number. Um, right. She's great in that. Um, and James Tinian IV put her to excellent use during his first run on Batman um, across Detective Comics, which started during the Rebirth era in 2016. So, oh, that's good to know. Um, I'll have to check that out. Oh, my God. Uh, there's an <laughs> omnibus for it. Um, of course there is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it's, let me think, uh, it's j right around 40 issues. Okay. It's like seven arcs, something like that. Yeah. Um, it's good. It's yeah. probably my favorite Batman from the last five years, hands down. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, Matt, thank you very much. So first of all, hold on, let me, <laughs> let me start over and say, so that concludes our first rendition of what are you reading in comics or whatever I come up with with hey. this part of the show. But I got to say, I love this. I love hearing what people are reading. And I love talking to you about these issues as well, too. This was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it. So I'm very excited about having the segment on. I hope everybody else is as well, too. But this was really cool. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm really excited that you were the first person to do this with me. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hey, you're very um, welcome. Well, and thank you for coming on to the show and sharing us, sharing with us your journey with comics and with Comic Watch. Um, for all of our listeners, before I let you go, where can they find you and your work online? Uh, www.comic-watch.com. We're on Facebook. Uh, we're also on Twitter. Um, we have a kind of busted Instagram. We're, we're working to get that fixed. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, check us out on those places, and um, yeah, just follow us on on the interweb. See what's cooking. We've got cool new stuff every day. Yes, and and it's important to know it's comic dash watch, like you said. Yes, because if you put comicwatch dot com, really it just that cash wasn't there. Because <laughs> so good. Well, there's got to be a way to maybe buy that domain and just redirect people to our main one. But uh, I don't know the logistics yeah. of that. I'm sure you looked into that. I have. It's a lot of hassle. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thanks again, Matt. I really appreciate you coming on the show, and I'm looking forward to you know working with you more on Comic Watch. So, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And that wraps up another episode of The Caps and Life. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. You can follow us on social media at Caps and Life. For more information about us and all of our previous episodes, visit thecapsandlife.com. Okay.